What on earth was that? Welcome to the Drone and RC Model Aircraft News for another week. It's March the 8th, 2024. Where's the year gone? Anyway, that image, that image was on a story in the Daily Mail about the UK police using drones. And I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that. You probably couldn't believe your eyes either. What, a hell, what the hell is going on with that image? Now, I thought this must have been AI. Surely this is AI. Someone's gone to ChatGPT, one of the little interns at the Daily Mail, gone on to ChatGPT and said, give me a picture of a policeman flying a drone FPV. And that's what ChatGPT came up with. Well, no, maybe apparently not, because that image has been used in other stories. And someone pointed to me to the Getty Images Library. It's part of the Getty Images Library, which is a library of copyrighted images and there's even a name associated with it. So someone allegedly has taken a picture of a policeman doing that. Now we haven't used long wire since 2008 and those FPV goggles, I don't, I don't recall ever having seen any goggles that look even remotely like that. So I don't know what's going on there but it's just part of the, it's actually a perfect image for a story by the Daily Mail because it looks totally bogus and totally fictitious. Who knows? If you know, then please comment, let us know. If you've seen that image somewhere else or you know who, who the policeman is or who took it and what the, what the backstory is, let us know. It's crazy. In fact, the whole news this week is kind of crazy. There's been some really weird stuff going on. Got some weird footage for you, some weird pictures, and hopefully you'll find them useful, interesting, and maybe even entertaining. I don't know. Right, what have I got on my list of stuff here? Well, here's another image that I, find, I found very interesting and also wondered if it may have been AI in origin. And this drone, this quite large drone, is laying in pieces on the ground. Mm, it has fallen, obviously, from quite a height, but not a sufficiently high height to allow the parachute to arrest its descent because everything's broken. But you can see there is a parachute there. Now, I, again, thought this might have been AI because it's, it's like a, it's a weird, I haven't seen a drone like that before, certainly not that large, but it does raise an interesting point that I know parachutes are being sold as a safety feature. You know, you can, you can fly over people if you've got a parachute on your drone because it will arrest its descent and everyone will be safe. And it's not true. It's simply not true because there are a number of factors. If the drone is too low, then the parachute won't have time to deploy. If the drone is high, um, then it will probably, if there's any kind of wind, it will probably land quite some way away from its originally planned course, which means you could be flying well clear of a school, but then something goes wrong, the parachute deploys, and the drone drifts into a school ground where children are playing. And if there's any kind of crosswind, say even just a like a 15 mile an hour wind, and that drone weighs, say, let's say 60 pounds, what happens to a, a six-year-old child, child who is hit by 60 pounds traveling at 15 miles an hour? They could be very badly injured. So parachutes do not totally mitigate the risks associated with flying drones in an urban suburban environment. But I don't think that will stop the regulators from issuing all sorts of licenses and permits and waivers for companies like Amazon and Google to fly their drones where we are not even allowed to fly a little 250 gram foam models of Piper Cubs because money, that's what drives all these decisions. Uh, and it's really kind of sad to be totally honest. Now, speaking of safety as well, uh, we've seen problems with Boeings and bits falling off them recently. Not a good look, not a good look. And the FAA seems to be far too focused on remote ID. This week they've put stuff on Facebook and on Twitter saying remote ID is coming, make sure you're prepared and you know asking little questions to see if you've got the knowledge. You know, we're going to be enforcing as of the 16th of this month, less than two weeks as I make this video, they'll be out there enforcing remote ID. So they're very focused on our little toys, our little foam models of Piper Cubs and little recreational drones and things which is why I th thought that this piece of footage here should be shown. This was on Twitter. It is a, I think it's a Boeing 777 taking off from an airport and the wheel falls off. Seriously, a wheel falls off? You might think, oh, that's not very good, but these things happen. It probably bounced down the runway. They recovered it, no problem. No, 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 no. This wheel landed in the car park <laughs> and destroyed two cars. So imagine if it had been just a bit to one side and there was someone standing there. Imagine, th this is potentially lethal. I mean. When our little toys fly around, they don't really pose a threat to anyone. The, the, the history, the, the data, the track record, the historical information proves that recreational multi-rotor drone use is not a threat to human life. Been over a decade, not one single death. But here we have Boeing dropping bits of plane with increasing regularity in a way that definitely puts human life at risk. Definitely. If you'd been hit by that wheel, you would be splattered. No question about it. Not even remote ID on that wheel. That wouldn't have saved you. So 
Again, I have to ask the question, why are the FAA not focused on the things that matter? The things that really will cost human lives. Why are they focused on our hobby? Well, again, the same reason that I mentioned before, money. It's all about the narrative. It's all about people, corporations with huge amounts of money having unreasonable amounts of influence and skewing the risk. And so they can do things far riskier than you or I can do with much worse consequences and a higher degree of probability. It's just, it's unreasonable. But we're not pushing back. Where's our pushback? We're just sitting here going, oh, you know, I lead the charge, but there's not a lot of people following me at the moment. Where's the national model flying bodies? Where is the industry? You know, where, where, where are everyone else? Where's everyone else saying this is unreasonable? Uh, I don't know. And what else have we got here? I've got a list. I'm old, as I said last time. I'm old. I have to do a list because I forget. Um, oh, yeah. Now, speaking of dangers and drones, and one of the big things that the regulators like to tell us is that if a drone hits a helicopter, people will die. Well, drones have hit helicopters. Nobody's died. No one's even been injured. There have been some pretty impressive collisions, like when the Royal Canadian Mounted Police flew their drone into a their own turbine powered helicopter and the helicopter had to land and be trailered away. Then I think it was in New Mexico or somewhere, the uh, uh, Hughes 500, which was filming a Baja race, hit a drone and they had to land and be trailered away. In neither case was anyone injured. The drones were destroyed, but no one was injured. Um, yet we're told this is a major threat, it's a major danger. We can't possibly fly a helicopter. You know, we, if we've got a forest fire and someone sees a drone a mile away, all the helicopters and planes have to be grounded because, you know, people will die if a drone flies even close to a helicopter. Well, in Arizona, a man was sentenced this week to prison. What was his crime? Well, he tried to shoot police officers, which is not a good thing to do. It, it will get you offside with the authorities if you start shooting at them. But they also charged him with trying to bring down a police helicopter with his drone. He tried to fly his recreational multi-rotor drone into the police helicopter and failed, which Again, it's another data point. Even when you try to bring down a helicopter with a drone, it doesn't work. It's actually incredibly hard to fly, deliberately fly a drone into a helicopter. The rotor downwash alone is going to blow most recreational drones away. It'll just blow them down. You'd have to come up from above and go down, and even then, the chances are that you'll pass through the rotor disc without hitting a rotor. It is very, very difficult to fly a drone into a helicopter, as this gentleman discovered to his cost. So again, another data point. This drone versus helicopter thing, massively overstated. The narrative is false. It is, it is, the level of risk is, has proven, been proven over time to be massively misstated. And we must correct this. We must correct it. Yes, there's always a risk, but the probability is so small that the risk itself becomes small. You have more chance of being hit by falling space junk. I think we've already established that. Now, what else is in my list of stuff here? Um, well, I spoke last week about DJI and some right-wing US politicians wanting to ban DJI because they are spying for the Chinese government and all that sort of stuff. You know, As I said, I don't know the reality of the situation. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert who knows, has inside knowledge. I haven't got a damn clue. Um, both sides make some cogent points, but you know, it's, in this day and age, you cannot believe anything you hear or see because disinformation, AI, all that sort of stuff, the, the world is increasingly just a fiction, a work of fiction. <laughs> anyway, so DJI have responded to this political pressure and issued a formal statement about their involvement in spying so forth. And they basically said, we don't spy for the Chinese government. We do not send our information back to servers in China. And then they've put in the small print by default. Hmm, why did they need to include the words by default? Because Defaults are great things. Defaults can save you a lot of time. You know, you get a computer and there's all these options. If they set to a default option, oh, that's fine, click accept. Simple. Saves you having to click all the buttons. Well, defaults are fantastic. But the problem with defaults is that they can be changed without you even knowing. So imagine that you get an update to your DJI software and it changes all the defaults. You know, yes, do send my data back to Beijing. Yes, do um, you know, advise the Chinese government of any sensitive sites I'm flying there. Could it happen? I don't know. But I mean, they've covered their ass by saying by default. Just like the FAA, when they published the final rule for remote ID, said there will be no network component to the remote ID system at this time. They covered their ass by saying at this time, because they will put a network component in later on. So it's very, you know, weasel words. Weasel words are just the uh, lingua franca of everybody these days. Everyone wants to use weasel words because then they can't be... Um, they, no one can say, you said this. They can say, oh, I did say that, but the small print by default at this time. 
Yeah, it's a worry. The world is, is a crazy place full of too many dishonest people, if you ask me. Now, here's something close to my heart. I spied this today. It is a pulse jet engine on a model airplane. Well, who would have done that? <laughs> I bet no one ever thought of that before. Um, but the Wave, what, is the, what do they call themselves? Wave Engine Corporation. They published a video on YouTube which shows this A10 looking RC model aircraft with a pulse jet engine on it, taking off, flying around and landing. Not a very good landing. They really overshot the landing spot. Um, but there was a news story on Yahoo News saying this co this company is, you know, the the, the new generation of, of aeronautical propulsion, these pulse jets are going to change the world, blah, 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 blah. And they've got a wonderful website which they sort of proclaim to be leading the, the future. And I just, I, oh, again, as I said, the world is full of illusion. It's full of bullshit and illusion because what these people have done is they've taken a decades old pulse jet design called the uh, Lockwood pulse jet, designed by Ed Lockwood when he was working for Hiller in the 1950s designed this engine because it, in the 1950s the US government was throwing money around like water at anybody that had a re what they thought could be a really good idea, certainly if it was associated with military or aviation. There was so much innovation in military and aviation in the 1950s and 60s. It was a wonderful time for anyone who liked, you know, any geek that liked playing with stuff. It was fantastic. There were brilliant ideas conceived and the world was an exciting place. Jet engines were new and the space program was just about to kick off. It was a brilliant time. So you could get money for anything. and they, they paid Lockwood um, and Heller to, to build this engine, and they did. And it's a compact little pulse jet engine, produces 55 pounds of thrust. I've built a lot of them. I put them on, um, what do I put them on? I put them on go-karts, I put them on canoes, on um, hoverboards, on dragsters, everything. Because it's a simple engine to build, it's because it's so simple, it's predictable, they just work reasonably well. They're not efficient, terribly inefficient, and they make a lot of noise, generate a lot of heat. You've probably seen my videos from the early days, you know, they glow red hot, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's great, but these people took one of these engines and they put it on a model airplane. Initially they put it on a glider, to be honest. They put it on a glider, as you can see in the, in the story, which I'll link down below, trying to remember to include the links this week. Put it on a glider, and that... Um, glider was propelled with this pulse jet engine. That's nothing new either. I think the Germans were using pulse jets on their gliders uh, in the lead up to World War II when they were training, trying to train their, uh, their soldiers without having an air force as such. Um, they put, um, I think it was the Escapette engine, which was a very long, thin pulse jet engine um, designed in France, I think, and a valveless pulse jet engine, very similar to the Lockwood. There's nothing new under the sun. They put them on gliders, used them. So this, this company, this Wave Engine Corporation, have just reinvented a wheel. They've taken a 50-year-old design and they've put it on a model airplane and flown it and said, look, aren't we good? And I thought, yeah, it's fair enough. And what they did do, though, uh, they tried to improve the fuel consumption by using timed fuel injection by the look of it. That's, that's a new twist. Well, is it? Because, hang on a minute, I did that 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I added an electronic um, computer control system to the... Lockwood engine, to a valveless pulse jet engine, to time the fuel injection to reduce the fuel burn. And it worked really well. Here is a picture of my original prototype electronic control unit for the engine. I did it 20 years ago. These people have done it now. And I thought, ah, fair enough, good on them. You know, it's a, you know there's no new ideas. Great minds think alike. It's a good idea. It does reduce the fuel consumption a little bit, but I, I found it to be pretty much a dead end because of the other negative aspects of a traditional pulse jet engine. So that's fine. But then I read another story. <laughs> and I discovered, to my shock and awe, that the Wave Engine Corporation got a million dollar US military contract for this thing. A million bucks! I did it 20 years ago for probably $5,000 worth of time, effort and equipment. <laughs> and they got a million bucks to do the same thing. Oh, I've missed my calling. I should be out there pitching myself to the US military. Oh, after I got the drone experience, got the pulse jet experience, I could be their go-to man. They can give me a million bucks, I'll do whatever they like. <laughs> Are you listening, US military? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like the 50s, isn't it? When they're throwing money around like water on anything. Anyone that comes up with a good story gets a handful of cash. Trouble is it comes out of, out of your pockets and you have to pay more tax. Oh, I don't know. The, the, as I say, and it's just, it's a fantasy. The world is a fantasy. I just can't believe it. But no, that's, that's what happens. And finally in the news, no, not quite finally, almost finally, um, I noticed that there was this story about a Russian drone found in Ukraine. It's an FPV drone and it was trailing some kind of wire or fiber optic cable. And all I can think of is that 
they were using this as a way of defeating electronic countermeasures. The, the, because FPV video signals can be you know, interfered with and control links can be interfered with, maybe the Russians are using fly-by-wire drones. You know, I mean, makes sense, doesn't it? Because we still have fly-by-wire missiles. You know, we have missiles that are launched and they trail out a thin strand of wire which is use, used to control a missile. So they're immune to electronic countermeasures, jamming systems. Maybe they're doing that with FPV drones now. I don't know. It's a bit hard to tell from these stories because they're written by people who know nothing and make a lot of crap up. But uh, it's a very interesting twist. Maybe we should all go to control line FPV and get around the regulations. What do you think? <laughs> Actually, that would be one of the most disorienting things I can think of. Flying a control line model with FPV goggles on. I should give it a go. What do you think? Go down in the comments. Tell me if you think I should try that. <laughs> I think I'd fall flat on my face within a couple of turns. And finally, also UTM for Australia. Yep, Australia government has decided they're going to pay someone to build a UTM for them unmanned traffic management system to coordinate the movement of all the drones, which means you know you're going to have network remote ID, don't you, Australia? If they've already committed to building the UTM, you know network remote ID is already been decided. Because without network remote ID, a UTM is of no value. Oh dear. <laughs> building the technology a decade and a half before it's really needed. Do you know what that means? You know what happens when you build, build a solution so far in advance of a problem becoming an issue, you end up with outdated technology when you most need it. Yep. By the time they need a UTM, the, the, the technology and the standards they've developed will be 15 years out of date. And that means it's going to be so inefficient, so expensive to run and maintain, it'll be a disaster. Why not wait until we need a UTM before you start spending valuable taxpayers' money on building one? You people are crazy. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, there you go. That's it. Thank you so much for watching. And I'd like to ask you a favor. No, don't subscribe. Don't um, thumbs up, that sort of stuff. Um, I'm trying to get more people aware of what's going on in the industry and, the, and the, the way that the media, the governments, the regulators are vilifying our hobby unreasonably to, to pursue an agenda which is driven by money. I would like you, if you can, to spread the link to this video, to the news video, to as many people as you can, through your socials, whatever. We need more people being informed objectively about what's really going on. And no one else is doing it, so I might as well take that burden on my shoulders. So I will continue to make the weekly news from the view of the hobby and the industry, pointing out that things are not as they are being portrayed in the media or by regulators, or by politicians, and that we need some balance and objectivity being brought into this whole thing. So I'm your man, I'll do it. But to do that, I need you to make sure people see my videos. So please spread word far and wide. And I'd like to thank all the people who support the channel directly through Patreon or through channel memberships. And it's because of them that you get to watch this video coming up to 18 minutes long without a single mid-roll ad. That's the bonus, that's the benefit. You're not going to get interrupted by those inane, unskippable 15 second ads that I hate, and I'm sure you do too, unless you've got premium, YouTube premium. Anyway, I want to get this out before 20 seconds, so thank you for watching. Stay tuned, more to come, more news next week. Bye for now. Overregulation is like a tumor. It's killing a hobby. It must be terminated now.